What is the gospel? We know that the word gospel comes or is most often rendered as the word good news. And it comes from the word euangelion. That's the Greek word. Euangelion comes from the first two letters, E-U, which we get the word eulogy from. You know, when somebody shares a eulogy, they're actually sharing a good word about somebody. The word E-U means good. And euangelion literally means an angel, angelion. So a good mess. And what's, what does an angel do, everyone? An angel is a messenger sent from God with a message from God. So euangelion is literally a good word from God sent through a messenger. And those messengers are, guess who, everyone? It's us. We are called to do the divine work of dispensing or proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a responsibility that is. And of course, our definition of the gospel, just to make sure that we are crystal clear on it, is it is the, uh, the good news of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So the good news is the uh, proclamation of the good news of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Any message that's preached on a Sunday morning or any other time around the world that doesn't have Jesus Christ in it has departed from the gospel. In, its, in that it's not centred in and around the person of the work of Jesus Christ has departed from the gospel. It is, as Paul says to the Galatians, another gospel. A gospel according to works, a gospel according to flesh, a gospel according to man, but it is not God's gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, let's turn there now together and let's just reiterate on this verse. This is Paul's verse, but it's also our verse. He opens up his introduction to, to the church at Rome of where he would be soon to be killed. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant, a doulos, really accurately rendered, it's a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel. And it's God's gospel. The gospel of God. Again, that possessive text there is the most uh, personalised that, that the actual Greek wording can make it. So when you say that's mine, I want it. If you've got... Uh, so we got some little kids here this morning, and when they got something that's there, they say, that's mine. And they hold it to them and they say, that's mine, you're not taking it. Mm-hmm. All right? And any of us who are mums or dads know exactly what that's like. It's quite a natural thing. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? God's possessive about his gospel. It's his message. It's owned by him. It's authored by him. And it is cared for and invested with power to save, which we'll talk about this morning, by him. Yes. So we're dealing with something that's God's. Do you know, there's been a search in history for years for the Holy Grail, hasn't there? But, you know, we have the gospel. That is something that is given to us by God. Instead of looking for those things like the Grail and so forth and the ancient relics, we should be remembering that God has given us mysteries to actually steward. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. And the gospel is one of those things. It's a message that makes no sense to the world, but yet it has the power to save somebody from eternity in hell to eternity in heaven. To open somebody's eyes to Jesus Christ and for their old ways to be changed. This is why Paul says, I'm separated by God to that message. I have no other call and I'm a slave to it. I mean, that's, I don't know how strong a terminology that we can get there. And so let's talk now as we work through Uh, the basis of the gospel last week we looked at Christ is the foundation of the gospel 1 Corinthians chapter 3 there is no other foundation laid that anyone else should be laying upon apart from the one which is already laid past tense that foundation everyone is Jesus Christ anyone that builds on that foundation will receive a reward gold, silver, precious stones many will build on there and we should be careful how we build the word is architectone or architect in the Greek, and that literally means you're a fellow labourer or builder together with God, and you should be careful how you build, because you could build not on Jesus Christ, and that would be burned up. You will be saved, but as by fire, uh, and so you will suffer loss. All of your work in the flesh would be lost, because it wasn't built on the work of Jesus Christ, and we see this in the picture of many saying, Lord, Lord. 
Uh, Jesus doesn't even know them. They're not even saved. They're actually a, another version again. And so you're going to be careful with those things that we're building according to the foundation. Then, Christ is its content. Jesus Christ is the content of all Scripture. Can I get an amen? Yes, amen. Well, Genesis right through the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is its content. Therefore, anything we teach, any message we share, when you share the gospel with somebody... It must not contain more about you than it did about Jesus Christ. These testimonies that are all about us and me and my and I, they're all the wrong wording. Our focus is like it should be in prayer. He, thy, yours, his. And that's kind of the focus. All right. Yes, God has done something in your life, but it's only to show Jesus Christ through you. Friends, if you show up on the day that you die to judgment in your own righteousness and robe of righteousness, we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So we need to be clothed in His righteousness. That's why it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, He is the glory of the gospel. He is why the message is glorious. It's worth dying for. It's worth living for. It's worth sacrificing for. It's worth going to Indonesia for. It's worth tiling the floor for. It's worth working with the kids and getting in there and seeing their lives changed and encouraging the saints that are working so hard on the ground over there. And certainly I'm excited that we're going to be doing more and more in Indonesia as the door of opportunity has opened for us. We're a small church, but it doesn't mean we can't have a big impact. So let's be encouraged by that this morning as we work through um, this message together. So let's work through now in our next stage, the design of the gospel. The gospel is... And I'd like you to turn with me as I get my notes together here to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. Talking about the design of the gospel is designed that the gospel will. It's not a, an optional thing here. This is the great commission, not the great suggestion. This is the great commission, the gospel will. Uh, will go to all the nations. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel. There is only one gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. The king who is Christ and the kingdom. His reign, his rule. When we say the kingdom, we mean the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. That is not an earthly reign. That is a reign of the heart. That is a reign of the mind. We will love and serve the Lord God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. Amen. Does Jesus Christ reign in your life? Amen. It's going to be pretty easy because there's going to be obvious fruits in your life, in your priorities, in your actions. Well, let's have a look because this line is incredibly revealing. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a testimony to the nations and then the end will come. The gospel testifies to all nations of Jesus Christ and what he has done. Now, Mark, quickly turn with me to Mark 13.10. This is even more of a succinct line that Mark records, the same as Matthew. Mark's gospel is a lot shorter in nature, literally half the size of Matthew's, and there's reasons for that. But uh, we won't get into that here. Mark's very short, short and to the point. And Mark says in Mark 13, verse 10, and the gospel, which is the message, must first be preached to all nations. The must is necessity. The first is priority. The preaching is the methodology. And the nations are the proximity. We have priority. We have necessity. We have methodology and proximity. It must. Do you know it was said when Jesus Christ was about to be born that Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the nations or the nation of Israel or the Roman world at that time should be taken under census. Now, if the decree of Caesar was upheld, how much more the decree and the ordination of God that every creature of his creation should hear the outward call of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Friends, this will be done. You are privileged enough to be invited to do it, but whether you do or not, that is something you must take on as your own personal calling as Paul did. I'm separated to the gospel of God. Will you be one of those that the Lord says? Here's a challenge. You were one of those who preached my gospel. Not who just lived a Christian life, who honoured Jesus in their life and, and just managed to get to heaven. But you were one of those that will receive gold, 
silver and precious stones. Let me show you something else to keep things moving here this morning and being preached to all the nations. God has invested the gospel message with his own power to save. He gives people ears to hear it. Now in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 1, you can turn there if you want. You're all keeping up with me pretty well here. And while you're turning there, let me say that the gospel is the litmus test for those who are called to salvation. The outward call will go out to everyone, but not everyone gets the inward call. All right, let me just say that again. The outward call must go out to everyone. It must be preached to all the nations. Amen? But not everyone's going to get that inward call. You know if you've shared your testimony of the saving power of the gospel in your life, the good news, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, what Christ has done in you, remember that's why Christ in you is the hope of glory. You're not the hope of glory. He in you is the hope of glory. And as you share that, to some people, it is folly. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It is foolishness. You're giving your life away to that church. I suppose you're giving them money too. I suppose they're taking up offerings. Yeah, like every not-for-profit does, really, when you think about it. You know, I suppose that the, the pastor's going to be asking things of you. and you're, You know what? At least you're not at the pokies gambling it away or at the front. They're not complaining about that, though. If you were drinking away your money or gambling away your money, but all of a sudden people have a problem with you coming to know Jesus Christ and connecting him with what he's doing, which is building his church. This is why the world, Jesus says, it hated me first, so don't be surprised if it doesn't like what you're doing either. This is why as Christians, we've got to get over that uncomfortable bridge. We're going to cross over the uncomfortable bridge and go, I've built my bridge, I'm over it. I'm prepared to be uh, uncomfortable with the fact that you don't like the message, but I've got to share that message. Because if you, by chance, God gives you ears to hear and you hear the inward call, then there's not going to be any greater experience for me than you coming to know Jesus Christ through the gospel that has been shared. And I was the vehicle of that. As Joel said this morning so beautifully from that scripture in Isaiah, how blessed are the feet of him or her who brings the good news. Have your feet ever been called blessed? Is there anyone in heaven that's going to ever say, you know, because of you, Lynn, because of you, Bianca, because of you, Corey, I'm here. In a, not in a natural sense, because you were simply the, the vessel that God used. But, you know, I think that's a critical question to ask. So let's talk about how the gospel message actually can save in some scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15.1. Now, I made known to you, brethren, the gospel. I want you to see here that the gospel isn't... We just think the gospel is for the unsaved. Who's the gospel being taught to here by Paul? Christians. Brothers. It's important that Christians get the gospel right. So I'm writing to you. I made known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you now stand, and by which you are saved, by which you are saved. God uses that message, the message that Jesus Christ came, died, lived a perfect life, rose again as God, and now he has become our Lord, our righteousness, our sanctification. That is the gospel. And of course, what we've got here is a message that has the power to save. 1 Corinthians 1.18. You can just flip back a few pages there. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But uh, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Linking, again, the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.21. Since the wisdom of the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached. That's the gospel. The foolishness of what was preached, this is 1 Corinthians 1.21, to save those who believe. And if you're not convinced, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation. It takes God's power to turn somebody from darkness to light. To change that carnal mindset that it's all about me, my life, my world, my priorities. Me, 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 me,
without him. That takes nothing short of the power of God. Now, if you can talk somebody into it, somebody else can talk them out of it. It needs the power of God. And there's only one message that we've been given for that changing power to transfer through, and that is when you start highlighting Jesus in your comments. That's why it's critical. Well, this message also, number three here, will humble man and glorify God. You know it's the gospel because it glorifies God and it, it humbles us. The gospel is not about how good you are, Ryan. You're a good bloke, but it's not about how good you are. It's about how good he is. The gospel is about showing us that we cannot do any good for God as sinful men. We need to repent of our sins and follow Christ. And in so doing, we serve the Lord and can now bring glory to him. Our salvation through the gospel was a means of bringing glory to him because it was all his work. You know, Ephesians, just turn there real quick. Um, I feel like I'm going to get bogged down, but I think it's a good bog down here because I just think we need to kind of get that scriptural grounding on why the gospel starts at humbling us first. Well, let's have a look. Ephesians chapter 2. And this is Paul's way of giving the gospel to the Ephesians. All right? So it's... 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians 2. There's lots of different ways that um, Paul communicates and Peter communicates the gospel in their epistles. But in this one, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead. Everyone say dead. dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Once walked. He's talking to the saved Christians here. Following the course of this world, following the prince and power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature. Mm -hmm. Underline it. You, you are born in this. You are born dead in transgressions and sins. That's why the Lord's prayer says, forgive us our sins. Only he can change the situation. Children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So what's our situation? It looks pretty bleak up front, friends. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We live according to the course of this world. We're given over to the lust of the flesh. We can't help but do anything but what our own body rules and reigns our life. Our appetites, our desires, our wants and our wills. All have lordship in our lives. Verse 4, but God. Here's his gospel message. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So here He's layering it up again for us. Made us alive together. Who ma He made us. We didn't make us. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Last verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. Everyone underline the word not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. So that guess what? If you had any part to play in it, what could you do? Well, I received Jesus into my life. I prayed the prayer. I did all those things. I witnessed to that person. No, no, no. It's all God. Yeah. You were dead. If I got Sarah to lie down on the ground this morning and she, she just kind of, she was dead. I could preach the gospel to her. I could say, you're going to go to hell. You need Jesus. Your life's not right with God. He's holy. You've got sin. I could, I could, do all, I could go through all the motions. I could beg. I could plead. But unless God awakens your soul, unless God brings you alive, makes you alive in Christ, awakens your soul, we're, we're history. Can we see that? Yes. Look in your own life. Let that be the litmus test. You were quite happy doing what you were doing. But somehow, through somebody sharing the gospel to you, somehow, somebody who had been touched by the life and work of Jesus Christ in their clumsy, silly, foolish way was able to communicate to you enough of that saving message, enough of that powerful message that you had your eyes 
and ears opened. Your spirit was made alive and God did that. And this is why by grace we are saved. Through faith, it is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest we boast. So who does all the glory go to? It goes to God. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the beginning of the gospel and he is the end of the gospel. And the sooner we say like John, less of me and more of you, the sooner we start seeing more of God working in our church, in our lives. Do you know why these guys were so impacted on their missions trip? Because they were thinking less about themselves more than ever before. They were, they were just looking and seeing need and hunger as Christ did as he looked out on the, on the crowds and, and had sorrow and compassion on them, the Bible says. He had a heart for others. And so here we have the whole drawing of the design of the gospel, which is to humble us. Because if, you, if you're not humble, you don't need a saviour. If you don't see your sin, you don't need a saviour. You're just quite happy to live in your life. Look at me. I've got my car. I've got my job. I'm working on the 30th 30, 30 story of this great building. I'm doing all these different things. I've got a great lady. I've got a like, great bloke. I'm getting on with my life. But everything seems to be coming together. Well, it's only really in crisis that we even think about the Lord. Well, so much is it to humble us that one preacher says, we may preach to you for a thousand years altogether, and never a soul of you would receive Christ unless the same spirit that spoke light into the primeval dark should say, let there be light. Mm. Salvation is a supernatural process, he goes on and says. God himself must come upon the scene before the eyes of man born blind will see. How this truth exalts God and lowers man. Yes, and the lower we are brought, the better. When we get to feel our utter helplessness, then will our extremity prove to be the opportunity of the grace of God. The design of the gospel, it would be a demonstration of the love of God for sinners. Well, Romans 5.8. The gospel is the good news, we say, because in it, the love of God is revealed. God demonstrates, Romans 5 eight, his own love for us in that while we were sinners, while we were dead in trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. As soon as we needed the good news of the gospel, because we were facing the wrath of God as unrepentant sinners. John Piper notes that God himself has rescued us from the wrath of God. Not mainly from ourselves and the mess we make of our lives, but from his own anger, his own righteous judgment. The gospel is the power of God for salvation from the wrath of God. The power that brings us to eternal safety and joy in the presence of God. This love of God revealed through Christ in the gospel is worked out wisely and legally and justly and truthfully. Nothing hidden, nothing suppressed. It takes our unrighteousness and God's righteousness into account and deals with them in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. While we were still dead, he died for us. The design is that it would be proclaimed by the weak to shame the strong. James, uh, let's just turn there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 27 through 31. That God, verse 27, has ended up with the foolish. No, actually, what did he do? He chose. He chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He chose the weak of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world. And the things which are despised. Making you feel really good here, isn't it? That God has chosen you. You know, great Lord, thanks. I appreciate you letting me know I'm foolish. Uh, I'm weak. I'm base. Yeah, because guess what? It's not about you. And Paul's just reminding us. Hey guys, don't get this thing that you're all really cool. Okay? And we do that so naturally, don't we? Okay, we we just kind of take the glory to ourselves. And the Lord says, I'm not going to share that with you. All right? 
And so he goes on and says, Has God not God chosen? Yes, even the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see a theme here, everyone? God humbling us that we may exalt him. And but of him you're in Christ, verse 30, who of God is made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Well, James 2.5, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen, there's the word again, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? Have you guys not just seen that? The poor of this world are rich in faith. Come on, isn't that the design of God? I'll take my message to the poorest of the poor, to the lowest of the low, and I'll just give them my glory. I'll give them all of those riches and all of those inheritances and things. You might not have it in this life, friend, but in the next. We see Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus has nothing in this life. He's begging for bread. But in the next life, he's a king. He's reigning in glory with our Lord. Let's kind of shake off that whole thing that we need to have this thing now. That just keeps us way down. It keeps us pulled back from really living the life that Christ has called us to live. When we're called to take up our cross, we're not called to take up our cross and our jewellery cabinet and our sports car and our... I mean, Jesus was a lone path in that cross. And he needed a little help along the way too. 1 Corinthians 4.10 We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. This is Paul upbraiding the Corinthians. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, and we are dishonoured. Well, Matthew Henry notes, God did not choose philosophers, orators, statesmen, men of wealth, power, interest in the world, to publish the gospel of grace and peace. He best judges what men and what measures serve the purposes of his glory. Do you know when you share the gospel and people look at you, I think the aim of God is... That has to be God. That can't be them. That can't be their power, their influence, their wealth. That has to be God. And this is why God uses such base, you know, it's just where we're at. And we've got to work with that and grasp that. God chooses those of us whom he knows will never be able to do this in our own abilities, strengths and talents. And in empowering us to do so, we see the work of Christ that is occurring in us. And not of us, but of Him. It is the work of God in us. The works that He has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Should walk in them. There's this really precarious thing here that we should walk in them. We're commanded to, which means we have an option not to. Alright? Commands don't have to be obeyed. And the Gospel as we'll look at next week, is likened and Jesus actually teaches on the gospel. And he says it's like a householder inviting somebody to a great feast. I mean, it's an invitation to a great feast. Who doesn't want to be there? Yet the servants go out and they give the invitation to those who are invited. And what do those who are invited do? Sorry, I've got better things in my life to do. I've got better feasts to go to. I just got married, I just got a house, I just got a car, I just got... And they push away the great invitation of the gospel, the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Yet we're compelled to go out into the highways and byways. And, you know, the dynamics of how Christ paints how the gospel works is absolutely astounding. It's like a net that will gather in both good and bad fish. And you know what? Don't pluck out the tears from the wheat because we're all together. So we don't even know in this room and who will be in this room, who is saved, who the visible and invisible church is, because the visible church isn't always, Lord, Lord, didn't we say to you? We don't know. Didn't you so good see? Yes, but bad seed comes up with it. So we don't know. We simply must preach the gospel and let God do that work in people's hearts and lives. Amen? And so finally... And we finish with this, it would go against the carnal nature, the natural tendencies. 1 Corinthians 1.18, 
This is folly to the natural world. You would sell your life out for a message about a God who would kill his son in cold blood? Yeah, when you know the reason behind that. When you look beyond the natural, remember all truth, scriptural truth, is spiritually discerned. You cannot understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to discern the nature and the character of God behind and in and through the gospel. 1 Corinthians one twenty three. But we preach Christ crucified. That's the gospel. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And 1 Corinthians 2.14, and I close with this. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, which is why salvation is a spiritual miracle. You need eyes to see, you need ears to hear. You're dead, you need to be risen to life in the Spirit, literally, to be able to go, wow. This is why, friends, when you do get saved and God grants you the gift of repentance, your eyes are open, you're going, I'm, I'm seeing things differently. I'm responding differently. It's like the other parable Jesus tells of the gospel. It's like the, uh, the uh, tradesperson, the merchant who's looking for riches. And when he finds the pearl of great price, when he actually gets it, he changes him. He's changed because he sold everything he had and he committed to that, hmm. to, to owning what was of the greatest, greatest price. Let's stand to our feet.